So a book, a bookshelf. This is the title of the session, and we have here with us Sanjeev Sahota, Anuradha Roy, and Marlon James in conversation with Anjum Hassan. Let's welcome all of them on stage. Welcome to the Booker Bookshelf, and uh, judging from these three very, very fascinating and very different books, um, it's been a very, very expansive Booker Bookshelf this year. There is Marlon James' A Brief History of Seven Killings, which is um, very many different things at one level, an account of organized crime in Jamaica from the 1970s to the present day, but it is also a story of Bob Marley and his vision for Jamaican society and how that intersected his, his dreams um, and his music intersected with uh, the lives and the ambitions of not just warlords in Jamaica, but also um, a great part of the Western world and their ambitions and their, their sort of the eye they had on Jamaica, especially America. Uh, Anuradha, Anuradha Roy's novel, Sleeping on Jupiter, um, sort of the other end of the spectrum from Marlin's kind of novel. It is a much more personal story, uh, a very delicately explored story of human interactions in a small seaside temple town on the eastern coast of India, uh, particularly the story of a young girl who's had a very, very difficult um, abuse past, who was adopted from India, went to Europe, has come back partly in search of her roots. But it's also a very amusing story of three elderly women on a journey for the first time, and how these characters, these three characters, the girl, a host of other characters interact and what, what happens when uh, they find themselves um, in this small town for the first time. Sanjeev Sahota's marvelous book, The Year of the Runaway, is very, very powerful and as I was just telling Sanjeev, I think also very disturbing account of the lives of uh, three young men from the Punjab trying to make it in Britain, uh, often in illegal ways. Uh, some of them are illegal immigrants, and contrasting with them, contrasting with their fairly desperate story, is the story of this wonderful girl called Narinder, who is um, very, very spiritual, sick, brought up in a very, very cloistered way. Uh, and what happens when her spiritual upbringing clashes with the more material, the more gritty ambitions of these three young men? So those are the three books that we'll be discussing today, and um, Marlon, Aruradha, and Sanjeev are all going to read from their books. But before that, I thought I would ask you three, what I hope are fairly sort of general framing questions that can help you talk a little bit about the book broadly uh, before you go on to read. Um, Sanjeev, I thought I would start with you. Um, and like I said, your book is very, a very powerful document, uh, seems almost ethnographic in some ways in the level of detail uh, with which you describe 
The different kinds of work, for instance, that these boys do, uh, trying to make it into middle class society, whether it's working in a takeaway or cleaning a sewer or working on a construction site. So I was very impressed, first of all, with how close to the bone of the immigrant, the work, working class immigrant experience you got. But what also disturbed me about the book was the bleakness uh, of their lives. And I was interested in how even the few characters in your novel who do make it and who sort of enter middle class society as immigrants are not necessarily very happy characters. So there's almost uh, an overarching bleakness. And I wondered if that says something about the immigrant experience per se? Does it say something about Punjabi society? What is it that you were, you were getting at? Um, hi everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, fantastic. Um, the bleakness, yeah, there is bleakness um, in the novel and for me it's connected to this, this idea of what an immigrant leaves behind, I think. I think I'm a, I'm, a child of immigrants and my um, parents, my dad is also the child of immigrants, my, um, my grandparents were in the part of Punjab which um, became Pakistan so they had to flee um, Lahore to um, Amritsar and then later on they then left Punjab for the UK and there's something about when an immigrant, you know, it's quite a hopeful thing to leave your country for another country, voluntarily leave your country for another country. It, it's, you know, you, there's various dreams and aspirations which, you, which come with that. But I think what people, or those immigrants that leave voluntarily perhaps don't realise is there's also a, a, a door closing behind them as well that can probably never be opened ever again. And um, the consequences of that are usually felt by the generations to come, you know, the children, the people like me who find themselves growing up in a country which which in some senses is part of, is, is you know, their country and is where I belong, but in, in perhaps in a deeper, perhaps in a spiritual way, will never be fully my country, I'll never be somewhere where I do feel um, completely at home and subsequently there's probably nowhere in the world that I can ever really call my land, which is perhaps positive for a novelist because that outside of aspect, but as a, as a person, as a, as a human, it's, it's, it creates some sort of internal um, questions and challenges which as an adolescent I think you have to overcome. So there's this bleakness of not finding a home which there's a character in the book called Dr. Jima who is born in England and he grows up in England and becomes a professor and yet he says you know no matter how many garden parties I attended I will never be accepted, I will never be, this will never be my home. And so there's this, there's this melancholy which I think suffuses um, the book, this sort of this longing for for um, a place to call home, which I think was in my first novel as well, and will probably be in all my books because it's something I think that is quite, um, I feel quite deeply mm. as well. So there's, that's probably the primary source of, of the bleakness in, in the book. But having, having described it as bleak, I also want to underline that it's... It's funny a, too. <laughs> it's, it's funny, uh, I think, but it's also very tender. It's a very tender, moving novel uh, about friendship, I think, and love. Um, and you use this word apne, uh, apne, yeah. apne uh, in, a, in a way mm. that has a resonance which is just not there I think in the word when you use it in ordinary conversation in India because apne just means your own but in, in Britain it has the special resonance of your own people and it's kind of also a default thing if you have no one else you, you still have your apne which is not to say that the apne are always going to help you I mean there are moments also of betrayal, uh, but I think the the sort of the default thing is that you have people who are going to help you, and that creates kind of yeah. There is certainly a lot of of, of resonance yeah. uh, with and this idea of belonging to your own people. And I find it funny how the idea of up and it changes no matter it, you know the, the, that circle of your up and it enlarges if you, where you are. Now in India, in Punjab, or in my in the village that I'm from in Punjab, my up and it are the people that are from my village. If I go outside of Punjab and I go to Jaipur, you up near other Punjabis. When you're in England and you say up, up near any brown people, they're there you're up near, there you're yeah. And yeah. that happens definitely with the immigrants in, um, in the old runaways who they start talking about their up near to mean, oh, is, is it up near? Are they brown people? But then within that, in this house of 15 
12 young men in the South, in, you know, in those hierarchies of caste which come to play a part and what kind of visa they have. Those ideas up in your own start having these quite violent um, connotations as well, and so which, which plays out in the book. It becomes quite a, a um, uh, quite a hotbed for a lot of um, you know, people think, oh no, I'm stronger than you, I, I'm more of an up and out than you, I belong more than you, if I should have that job. When there's one job and there's 12 people going for it, violence is, is almost inevitable. Marlon, that's that's a element in your novel as well. Uh, Which we, segue. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, we're we're talking about this whole thing of um, migrating as a very very powerful dream, mm -hmm. um, and that is strongly present in the Jamaica that you describe, where a lot of young people are just looking to get out. Yeah. Um, and I found that very recognizable, even though this is 1970s Jamaica, not. 2000s uh, Punjab, uh, mm -hmm. but an immediate um, similarity there between both your books. But your book is also much, much more um, ambitious in its scale because it's talking about politics, it's talking about music, it's talking about this emblematic figure uh, in, in Bob Marley. And given the fact that you're writing this story now, uh, after all this has happened, uh, where we're like 40, 40, 45 years down the line. Um, and Bob Marley is so recognizable now everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I wondered, what did you see as personally important to you in this story? Given mm -hmm. that in some ways it's not, not necessarily the political elements, but Marley's own journey and his music is much more accessible. How did you make this story your own? What appealed to you in it, and why did you th why did you want to write this yeah. novel? I think what appealed to me mostly about this um, story were the aspects of Marley. Sorry, that is not really known. Most people know Three Little Birds and and uh, the songs. And um, if Lord knows, if you're a college student in America, you probably got the Legend album. It was kind of it was almost the law. But I think. Um, in what, one of the things that I wanted to capture in this book, and I don't think a lot of people know, in fact, some people didn't know that they tried to kill him mm. in, in 1976. And uh, the thing about Marley is even at his most productive periods, most productive creative period, I cannot think of another artist ever who has had so many forces work out to get him. Um, so many forces out to destroy him, even as he's producing, creating, touring, um, every day. Some of those people are people who he considered friends. Um, there's just a chilling moment. They, interview, they, 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 they interviewed Bob Marley after he was shot. And they asked him, do you know who did it? And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm, I know. <laughs> and he's right. The people who, who killed him, are, who tried to kill him, are some of them are the people who would be you know, playing dominoes at his house only a couple of weeks before. So this sort of very close intimacy with the people who are trying to destroy you um, is something that I don't think a lot of people realize. Um, that's how, how, much, how, how, um, how much in danger he was for doing what he was doing. And, and, and that it was very likely that if these guys didn't try to kill him, somebody else would because of what Marley was beginning to signify, not necessarily in the world, but in Jamaica. Hmm. 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 I was also so amazed at his confidence in his role as an artist and what that means in terms of the power that he wields hmm. um, and the question that he seems to be asking himself, which is how do I use this power to make Jamaica a better place mm -hmm. uh, and he seems to want to bring people who are fighting together and he also seems to feel the foreign hand um, which in this case seems to be mostly America yeah. um, mm -hmm. is actually not acting in our interest though it seems to be it's just mm -hmm. dividing us so this uh, almost like a prophet like or a messiah like did, yeah. did you feel that when you were researching, researching um, you know I, I Everybody resists the, the Bob Marley's a prophet tag, and I resist it to an extent. Mm. I think that he, he was just very, he just had a sense of foresight when nobody else did. Mm. And a lot of what happened post Marley, including 
you know, the Jamaican upper class suddenly turning into Marley fans. Mm. Um, it's stuff he talked about and he sung about, you know, the whole idea of um, people are going to really, really reward me when I'm dead and can't do anything about it. He also sung about that. So he actually ended up being kind of, of, of really, really prophetic. I think he just really understood the contradictions of Jamaican society and just how wonderful it can be, but just how deeply, deeply messed up it is. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and which is why I think it becomes that prophetic. I mean, some of the stuff he was saying about Africa as well mm. ended up coming true, which is not just imbuing with some mystical powers, mm. I just, I just think he just was a really good songwriter. Uh, but yeah, but also the fact that they tried to kill him and didn't get him, that mm -hmm. contributes to the aura somehow. Uh, what mm -hmm. was also interesting to me is that uh, you're seeing a Marley here who is not the Marley of today, yeah. in the way he's known, mm -hmm. uh, but you're writing from today, but you're mm -hmm. able to recreate the immediacy of listening to the Marley tracks as they're coming out in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Not all of Jamaican society is into Rasta, as you, right. you do a wonderful job of showing how the middle class is really sniffy about this new Rasta thing. Mm. So that was very, that was, I think, wonderfully done. Uh, right. Sort of to recover a sense of what was it like to be young in 1970s Jamaica and be listening yeah. to Marley for the first time. Yeah, what it was like to be young, to be black, to be um, part of a whole new growing middle class, uh, to see a country where, where you know, class and race always intersected. Um, one, the, 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 but also the, the, um, the things we had to get over, the shadism, where, you know, yeah, that, you, that you, you, didn't, you didn't necessarily need, you know, white people around for white yeah. supremacy to be enacted in a country. You had you, the brown skin, the, the brown lighter skin, skin. The lighter skin, the lighter skin, um, going on, you know, so th there, there's all of these sort of very subtle shades. Mm of uh, racism and classism, one of the things that becomes an obsession in the book is every character thinks the other character speaks terribly. <laughs> so it was like, I am fine, but that person chats bad. And this whole idea of perfect English means something to aspire to, even though nobody, nobody speaks whatever that is. In fact, perfect English is actually a quite terrible thing to hear. Uh, yeah. Uh, and one of the ways you bring that alive, of course, in your book is that you have so many voices. It's a novel mm -hmm. told mm -hmm. in the first person voice of a whole range of characters. So no one character has actually taken over the English mm -hmm. or the language or the narrative uh, that you're trying to uh, get across. So, and and mm -hmm. when you do do your reading, I hope we get a, we, we get a sample of that. But Anuradha, mm -hmm. um, we're talking, we were talking a lot about not necessarily literary issues right now. We've been talking about immigration. We've been talking about um, the world as it was in the 1970s. Um, one of the things that I find very striking about this book as well as, I've read one of your previous books, Atlas yeah. of Impossible Longing. And um, you are an author who really enjoys getting into the minds of your characters, uh, the human play. Uh, and especially the emotional play and really I think you're very good at romance mm -hmm. um, maybe you could have you could have written romantic novels and gotten rich but you've chosen to write <laughs> <laughs> uh, much more um, affecting and deeply felt novels but really I still think that the the core of your interest and your strength is in those human interactions um, and so is th is that deliberate because this novel for instance seems to me to be set in Puri, but you don't call it Puri, you give it, you fictionalize it. I like making it uh, uh, and, and to me that means sort of a kind of fading out of the more historical, social clutter, if you like, so that you can focus on, on the characters and their story. Um, and how and why do you do that? Uh, making up places. Or, or, or focusing yeah. on the people uh, well, uh, relative to the place. I think when I start to write a book, the most important thing for me is the characters. I live quite intensely with them. They are very compelling for me. It is only after I've finished the book that I can step back and look at the themes of it. It's not as though I started this book thinking, I will write a book about violence against women in India. But when I had finished this book, I realized that it was about 
two kinds of violence. One was acts of violence against women and one was an atmosphere of violence against women which is pervasive in this country. And through the stories of the little girl who is abused and then comes back as mm -hmm. a character, uh, and through the stories of these three older women, I mean, one of the scenes in the book is when one of these older women goes to do this simple thing of just buying, she suddenly wants to drink vodka. And she goes to this little, uh, you know, grilled window in this pilgrim town where old ladies are just meant to meditate and pray and she says she wants to buy this bottle of vodka and the whole place is full of men who are sneering at her and uh, to me it was really important that the whole social setup of India uh, I think just years of suppressed rage at what South Asian women go through on a daily basis from when we are little to now, maybe not uh, actual acts of violence, but what we face even when we get into a lift or walk out in the street, anything at all, went into this book and got channeled through these characters. But for me, it is always important to drive the story through the emotional linkages between the characters. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do tend to set my books in small and fictional places. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've just been reading The Idiot, Dostoevsky's. Most of the action takes place in a tiny little town called Pavlovsk, which seems to have only three houses. Mm -hmm. These three houses are where the characters have, and there's a park where mm -hmm. they meet for assignations. Mm -hmm. And the characters have these titanic crises of faith and arguments and philosophical conversations. And you know that you need this very small setting to offset the hugeness of the themes. So I like to think of my own settings in that way. Um, I think that's, that's a, possibly a classic idea or classical idea yeah. of modern fiction. Uh, but one can also see that fiction today is moving into doing, trying to do other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can certainly see that in Marlon and Sanjeev's novel where fiction is trying to sort of go into a whole subculture yeah. and possibly cover everything about it. Um, mm -hmm. The politics, the language, um, how different registers in which people talk, yeah. the kind of work people do. Uh, so almost sociological. I Th think has that ever interested you? Well, I think just as you have a historical novel, there's, there are novels that are historical. There are novels that are anthropological in that sense. Mm. And I would say that mine are somewhat, I, I don't really write about specific sects or, I, my, my books are not really non-fiction based so far. So I am interested in the inner lives of characters quite deeply mm -hmm. and that is what I tend to write about, yeah. Um, one can also see a lot of the pleasure principle operating in your fiction because you linger uh, a great deal on uh, just a scene by the seaside or how someone feels listening to a song. So there's definitely a lot of value you still place on the, trans the sort of transient moment, um, yeah. and, uh, which is obviously one of the cornerstone of fiction, and not necessarily seeing that as them gen being generalized to saying anything about that society or right. even that person, but just for its own sake. So the the pleasure stroke, the poetic yeah. element in fiction. And I want to come back and talk a little bit about the kind of writers. You, see, yeah, you mentioned yeah, Dostoevsky, yeah. but um, maybe some of, yeah. some of the other writers and if there's a sense of a tradition. But Sanjeev, I just wanted to come back since yeah. we're on the subject of literature and how does fiction capture things that I think traditionally have been considered outside the realm of fiction. And when I say that, I mean also the kind of characters that you're describing are not necessarily the kind of characters who read. They're not literary in that, in that sense. They're, so in, they're doubly, I think, outside the pale of fiction. One, that they're not themselves very literary, and second, they're not the traditional subjects of literature. Um, and you come from a country where there has been a lot of writing about the immigrant, writing about the diaspora. 
Uh, so how do you relate to that? Do you see yourself as fitting in a tradition of writing about uh, Asian immigrants or non-white immigrants, brown immigrants, uh, immigrants of color, or are you going against the grain of that tradition as well, that genre? Um, I'm not consciously going against um, any grain or for that matter trying to fit in with any particular genre. I suppose I can see that there is quite a long tradition of writing about immigrants, not just in England, but you know, you can go to you know, Willa Carthur in Antonia, to um, uh, you know, Henry Roth and Call It Sleep, which is a wonderful novel about um, migrants and Italian migrants into, into the eastern seaboard of the US. Um, but I wasn't, a con I wasn't thinking about um, other forms of migrant literature or about, um, and a lot like Adorado actually, I very much started the book thinking I had one character in one scene, which is the opening scene of the book, which is Rundeep waiting for Narinda to arrive at the flat, and the rest of the novel sort of bloomed out of, out of, that, out of that moment, and it is just, for me, like Adorado, I do start off with character or a particular situation, and it enlarges from um, from that point, I mean, with the, I mean, of immigrants you know, and the immigration sort of culture and the immigrant experience has been something that I've known, um, you know, very deep bits while growing up in. I go to India, you know, every year, sometimes twice a year, and hearing these stories are just some things I've been hearing over the last fifteen, you know, ten, fifteen years. So it felt very easy and natural for me to want to try to put a novelistic framework around those stories and see how um, and it was felt like a subject that was meaty enough that would sustain the length of writing a novel. Writing a novel, you know, it's a long, you know, time consuming haul of a process and if the subject just needs to keep me interested, let alone me trying to keep the reader interested. After you know, if it's, it's four or five years work, I need to still want to know what's going to happen to these characters and still be interested in their subcultures and their sort of their um, their minds, um, and it felt like this was a great fit for for the novelistic um, treatment, really. And I'm really fascinated by structure, and um, and it just felt like these character stories would enable me to write about them in interesting. So there's there's, there's this book, but in the first half of this book, there's almost these, there's these novellas which pop up, which are eight to hundred pages long which take you back into these characters' histories. And I thought that would be a great way to show not just these immigrants in England, but also show where they've come from and what they've gone through and what they're running away from. And now even in England, they continue to run, just running for their lives all the time, just running, running, running. And that was uh, um, that theme of running away. It was, it was what carried me through to the end of the novel, I think. Hmm. Uh yeah, and I, but I continue to be interested in the question of how do you write about things that sometimes seem beyond the pale of description or beyond the pale of literature in some ways. Uh, and Marlon, you have a, you have a um, section, I think it's uh, in the voice of the Rolling Stone journalist Alex Pierce, and he's, mm -hmm. he's in the ghetto and he says, you cannot describe this or you cannot even take a photograph of this because it would be a lie. It would mm -hmm. aestheticize something and make, some, make it more beautiful than it actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that to me seemed almost like a metaphor for the difficulty of writing about some, mm -hmm. so somehow the too complex, the too um, ineluctable. Yeah. Uh, and did you ever feel that writing this book? I did. And the, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the journalist was just pretty much um, aping what V.S. Naipaul mm. said about a Jamaican slum that, that it's, uh, you know, West Kingston is a place of such unremitting ugliness that you can't take a photo of it because the beauty of the photographic process will lie to you as to how ugly it really is. Mm. And uh, having coming out of a career where I would run into photographers who would want to go into the biggest slum they could find because rusted zinc looks nice on camera. <laughs> I, I see that being aestheticized all the time. Um, and there's even a character in the book who challenges even that, who challenges even Naipaul, saying, yeah, but this is a place so ugly it shouldn't produce a pretty sentence ever. And I think that was, that was the challenge 
how do you write about ugliness? How do you write about violence? How do you write about unpleasant things? Because I do have a very ambivalent view about beautiful writing about terrible things. Mm -hmm. As I, there's a part of me that understands it, and there's a part of me that thinks it lets violence off the hook. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. come to a point where I could write about ugly things ugly, yeah. whatever that might mean, um, was a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it ended up with me just being as economical and artless for that, whatever that means as possible. Because I think that is a conflict. I think that's a, a conflict all artists face. What if you take a really beautiful photograph of a starving kid? Um, are we getting the impact of this child being star starving? Or are we admiring the brilliance of the photograph? Mm. At what point, this is, is what, you know, what Susan Sontag was talking about. At what point do we, is there, is there something being lost when you subject horrible things to something aesthetic? Were you responding to earlier accounts of Jamaica or earlier accounts of this particular chapter in its history? Um, uh, and did those uh, write in a way that you, that, that you were inspired by or discovered? Um, in, in all sorts of ways, even the positive. The, 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 um, you know, I'm, uh, pretty much all the travel writing about Jamaica is terrible. Um, it's, it's, it's always the same thing that a character in the book has a rant about it because everybody talks about how the people are beautiful and the country is beautiful but there's so much poverty <laughs> and, and and how everybody still manages to have a smile on their face uh, you know and i remember um this photographer came to jamaica and he was like my experience is that people love to have their photographs taken and i was like our experience is you take our photographs and sell it in the uk for a lot of money and we're still broke uh, so it's, it's yeah, I, I was, I did feel as if I was trying to counter a lot of those narratives, both good, well, things that they think are good and bad. Um, because there is no one story about Jamaica, there's no one story about India, there's no one story about anywhere. But one of the things that I find is there's still an insistence from writers, particularly travel writers, that they can find it that one story, that one sentence. There is no one sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and of course, um, a wonderful expression of the fact that there is no one sentence is all these voices that speak almost sil simultaneously uh, in your book in very, very different registers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, Marlon, if you, if you want to read a little bit. Uh, oh, say, sure. Yeah. Um, funny enough, this is somebody trying to speak in a standard English. Um, this is near the end of the book and um, most of my, quite a few of my characters um, have to live with the consequences of a violent event and this character um, fairly consumes her whole life and her whole life becomes an act of, an act of running away. So at this point she's living in the Bronx. She's come all the way from Kingston, Jamaica in 1976 to the Bronx in 1991. So she's at a pharmacy trying to get a prescription. Miss Segree? Millicent Segree, Miss Segree. It's not Miss. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem, Mrs. Segree. It's not Mrs. It's not Miss. It's Millicent Segree. Okay, ma'am. You know what? Fine. How much is it? The entire prescription is $14, ma'am. You know, most of this feminism business was nothing more than a white American woman telling non-white women what to do and how to do it. With this patronizing, if you become just like me, you'll be free crap. But if there's one thing I agree with, it's damn I hate when a man feels I should disclose my marital status to somebody I don't even know. Even this crap about status itself, as if married and spinster are the only two choices for defining myself. Well, because I'm a woman, I'm supposed to have a status at all. Hey, big boy, here's my status. Hi, before I tell you my name, here's my status. Maybe I should just say I'm a lesbian and throw the problem back in their face. Xanax for anxiety, Valium for sleep, Prozac for depression, Phenogram for nausea, Tylenol for headaches, Mylanta for, bro for bloating, Midol for cramps. I mean, Christ, menopause, come already. Isn't there some fast track? I'm at the right table on East Chester in the Bronx, just a block from my place on Corsa Avenue. August means I've been living there two years. 
Sorry. I fulfill prescriptions on East Chester because who wants to see a nurse bang so many pills? Yeah, things are confidential, but I've never come across anybody if given the chance wouldn't talk your business. So I cross the street to the bus stop and pop on a Zantac. I'm going to need a Zantac after wolfing down a muffin for breakfast. I wish Dunkin' Donuts wasn't all the way on Gun Hill Road. I could use some coffee, but I can't stand Dun Gun Hill Road. Outside the station is always the same old men with nowhere to go, and I can't tell if they're looking at me as men or as Jamaicans. To make it from the street to the door to the turnstile to the train would be hard enough if I haven't had to stand there in the pigeons waiting on the number five. And it never fails. Nobody waiting on the train looking like they have anywhere to go. No shopping bag, no knapsack. Me looking like Virgin Mary because I'm going to the hospital. Not a nurse, no training to be one. I have this system. It's really only three words. No more drama. I got it from black American women who are sick and tired of men and all their stuff. I don't want any fuss, cascas, conflict, disagreement, or entanglement. I don't even want drama on TV. Ever since the Jamaicans brought their party to the hospital, I had to add Tylenol to my list and add Xanax just so I could get through work. Now I'm waiting on the M10 express bus. Ever since then, I've had this headache right above my temple. It never gets better or worse. It just won't go away. Maybe it's a lump. Maybe I need to stop being a hypochondriac. Honestly, only two days ago I got so anxious I couldn't breathe and remembered that people have been known to die from anxiety attacks. And this only made me more anxious. The last time it happened, I had to start singing Just Got Paid out loud for it to pass at a bus stop in Manhattan. At the bus stop right now is a little girl running around singing something that sounds like I know what boys like but there's no way she could have heard of that song. The father is trying to balance the daughter, a baby really, with his newspaper. The little girl runs headfirst into his ribcage and he grunts and laughs. She pushes her bagel into his mouth and he takes a bite like a bear. She squeals. I try to look away but can't. Not until they look at me first. Girls who love their fathers always come at them sideways. I see it all the time in the hospital. Daddies carrying baby girls, sick baby girls with poor breathing or insect bites. Women supporting sick fathers for just one more MRI or a dose of chemo. Maybe fathers are just more narrow on the side. Yesterday, a teenage girl in the ER, after screaming at her father for 10 minutes, just came at him sideways and wrapped her arms all around him until her fingers met and rested his, her head right in his armpit for him to drape her. It's not like I miss my father. I don't even know if he's dead. But I'm starting to miss not taking Xanax. Thank you. <laughs> OK, this is going to sound very different. But Anuradha, would you like to read uh, a little bit from your book? Um. I'm reading a bit where there's this middle-aged photographer man who's reached a point in his life where he has a death wish because nothing's gone right to him for a very long time. So he's gone out for an early morning swim, which is something he does whenever he reaches any new seaside town. By degrees, the swell of the waves was below him and he was swimming with long strokes. There were no big waves. The water was gentle against his skin. A long distance from the shore, he found the absolute solitude he had been hungering for at dawn. It was as if he had become a shark, slicing through the water unnoticed, no connection with human life. Across an infinite stretch of aquamarine was the arc of the horizon holding in the sea. Last night, after leaving Nomi in her garden, he had idled in bed, typing a text message to her which said, the bottle's finished but the night is not. He had neither sent it nor deleted it and was now relieved that he had not been drunk enough to send her such corny drivel. The future was obvious. She would go home to some Nordic hulk of a boyfriend and he would go back to divorce papers. 
He felt weightless, his limbs loose and limp. Nomi's story of missing her train came back to him. How she had said, don't you feel like disappearing from your life sometimes? He stopped moving his legs, felt his feet fall away down, felt them pull him in after them. Something was sucking him downward and outward. He would not move his arms, he would not move at all. The sea could have him. His legs followed his feet, his hips followed his legs. He sank further down. Nothing mattered any longer but this sense of letting go and never having to try again. Not his wife, not her lover, not the dog, not the first boat he had made at 16 and sailed alone after his father died. When the water closed over him, all sound disappeared. Not another living thing in the world, nothing to go back to. Just when his lungs felt as if they would blow up and he was about to open his mouth and let the water fill him and take him, he found he had instead erupted into the air, gasping, coughing and flailing. He struggled to stay up, sank, let out a choking cry for help as he swallowed a bellyful of seawater. Thrashing around with all he had in him, he fought himself out of the water again. A boat had appeared from somewhere. It was bobbing next to him. It was painted green and yellow. Four fishermen were looking at him over its side, saying things he could not hear. One of the fishermen pushed an oar in his direction. He managed to get his hand, hands on it. He was dragged into the boat, fell against rusted tin and nets and ropes. The four men looked at him, pulled at their oars. He was very far from the shore, they said. These were dangerous waters with strong undertows and people were often sucked under. The fishermen were bare-bodied. Their arms were sinews and muscles and veins held in by parchment skin. Each man wore a headcloth against the sun which was more than halfway up the sky, fierce enough already to have burnt away the dawn. Suraj sat gasping for breath, listening to the fishermen cackling about their lousy luck, tossing insults and jokes back and forth. After an entire night at sea, all they had caught was a man. What's a man good for, eh? Can you eat a man? Can you fry it? and feed it to your children. Now a fish. You can use all parts of a fish, from its head, to its fins, to its tail. You can chew on its spine. You can fry its roe. You can eat your rice with its oil. The tiny ones you can eat whole, heads, bones, eyes and all, fried to a salty crunch. Fish can swim and sing and fly. They can even kill men. If not fish, a woman was a better find. If you fish a woman out of the water, you can lay her, or sell her, or set her to work. But what use is a man? If you had netted a man, you might as well throw him back in. So I, I really like the romantics in your novels, Anuradha, and I think Suraj, Suraj is, de, is, is definitely an anti-romantic. Uh, anti-romantic. Though, though Noni thinks he's a romantic because he's, he's always carving these little... Uh, he, she thinks he's an ass. Uh, uh, she calls him a fucking romantic at yeah. some point, <laughs> yeah. I remember. Uh, but uh, that was a really lovely passage. Um, talking of romantics though, Sanjeev, um, you have something very unromantic in your novel which is uh, <laughs> this thing called a visa marriage uh, <laughs> where uh, somebody who's who's a British citizen will marry someone who's not uh, just in order for them to have a passage into the country and of course it's, it's a purely formal arrangement uh, but with this sort of undertow of possibilities if the two are vulnerable as I think possibly happens in your novel where there's this wonderful character um, Narinder who uh, enters into a visa marriage uh, for reasons as the novel progresses that are not quite to do with um, anything that she wants for herself 
uh, but, but this larger idea she has of her place in the world and how she can help. So would you like to read a bit from... Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think we're... So this is from quite um, early on in the novel and it concerns um, Rindeep and Narinda who are engaged in a, a visa marriage, as Anjum said. So in this scene, um, Rindeep, you know, he's, he's about 19 years old, he's recently over from India, from Punjab, and he's feeling quite lonely and quite homesick, and he's bringing some of his clothes over in a suitcase to leave at the flat of Narinda, his um, quite secretive um, visa wife, who's also, um, this scene is set in Sheffield, which is in the north of England. Um, and Narinda is also recent, he, a recent arrival in Sheffield, she's from London. So Rindeep's got his suitcase and Narinda's just shown him into the flat. She hadn't changed anything much. It was all very plain. The single plain brown leather settee, a plain tablecloth, the bulb was still without its shade. Only the blackout curtains looked new. A pressure cooker was whistling on the stove and the whole worktop was a rich green pasture of herbs. Rindeep set his suitcase by the settee. How have you been? I'm getting used to it. Her hands were clasped loosely over her long black cardigan. You're, you're getting to know your way around? Yes, thank you. Well, at least the weather is getting a smidgen better now. I thought the snow would never stop. She gave a tiny smile, but said nothing. Rindeep wondered if she just wanted him to hurry up and leave again. He knelt before his case and thumbed the silver dials until the thing snapped open. Well, as I said on the phone, I brought some clothes and things for you to keep here. He draped a pair of matching shirts across the creased rump of the settee, along with some black trousers and starched blue jeans, all still on their bent wire hangers. He took a white carrier bag tied in a knot at the top and left this on the table. So, yeah, we've got shaving cream, aftershave, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, and maybe also some underwear, he added, in the casual manner he'd practiced on the way down. He reached back into his suitcase and handed her a slim red felt album. And these are photographs I think we, you, should hang up. He watched her palming through the pages. The first few were taken on their wedding day in a temple outside the city of Jandigarh. The later ones showed them enjoying themselves, laughing in a Florentine garden, choosing gifts at a market. They look believable to me, she said. Yeah, the lawyer, he sorted it all out. He said sometimes they asked to see where we went on, ho on holiday. He sidestepped, saying honeymoon. There are dates on the back, but are there stamps on our passports? Yeah, it's all taken care of. I only hope we've got enough. I'm hearing rumors of raids. There was a sort of frozen alarm in her face, which thought it in comprehension. You, you think this place will be raided, but by who? Oh, it's just people at work talking. No, there's always rumours, but I guess it is better to be prepared. Maybe I should, you know, come and, come and live here, he said, testing the water a little. The shock of the suggestion seemed to force her mouth to open. I wasn't being serious. It's too small, she said, and the weather, she added, randomly. I understand completely, he said, layering smiles over his disappointment. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been so warm in a house, with food smelling as good as that on the cooker. She made to walk him to the door. No, I'll help you with this first. It's not fair to leave you to pack it all away. Delay tactics. She said she'd do it later, that it wasn't a problem. Reluctantly, Rundit followed her down the stairs. As she opened the door, he took the money out of his pocket and handed it to her. Another month, she said. The year will be over before we know it. Yes, he replied, shaking his head, as if amazed how quickly the time was passing, when really it seemed to him that each new week took on the span of an entire age. Thank you. Thank you. So this visa marriage is this rather painful performance that the two have to enact and it gets especially painful when 
these officers the come, inspectors come to visit. yeah, the inspectors <laughs> come to visit and they have to pretend that they're, they're sort of uh, participating in this happy domesticity and they know... And he's uh, much more into the marriage than she is. Than, than she is <laughs> and he, 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 he sort of um, even talks about the kids and where they're going to go to school yeah. and stuff. And so, it's all in, yeah, he's, yeah he's it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's incredibly moving, moving scene mm. in the book. But what I, what I thought was interesting and, and the, the part where the inspectors come uh, sort of reinforces it is that your novel is for the most part set in, in Britain and there are these young Punjabi men moving through all of Britain in search of work. I mean, they're traveling all the time and yet they're not in the country really in, a, in, a, in, in any uh, sort of engaged way. They barely see things for their own sake. They never notice a tree or a, or a landscape or, or any element of the architecture or people. Everything is either obstacle in their path to making it or it's uh, uh, an enabler and so they will use it and, and, and try to move on. Uh, and that to me seemed very stark, the way they sort of don't quite engage with the place that they're in. Um, You're right, they do go, they will go anywhere, they'll, you know, if, if they work there in Sheffield because they found work in Sheffield, but they'll go to Manchester if there was, there's work there, they'll, they'll be shoveling, you know, cracking card if, if, you know, wherever there's work they will. They will go, they'll get in the van and they'll go there. And this is the whole, the reason why they can't engage with England, because they, they, don't, they don't speak to any white people and they avoid speaking to any white people because they don't want to talk to anyone that they don't think they can immediately trust. He might set, you know, shot them to the police, for example. And when they are out in England, they're either, you know, working underground or working in the kitchens or working in these windowless places where, or, or they're working on construction sites where it's all about just getting as much work as they, them as they come so because they're often paid by paid by the hour and then they leave the house at four or five in the morning in the dark at 10 minute intervals to avoid it looking suspicious they arrive at seven eight nine ten o'clock mm. in the evening often to go to a second job so they're very much living in these hidden darkened corners of mm. of of the uk mm. and they don't they don't really see the light in any in any meaningful mm. sense they don't have time to stop and admire the shape of a tree or how beautiful the landscape might be that they're, they're, they're there to to run across well there is a scene towards the end of the novel where narinda suddenly breaks free of the kind of life she's been living and she takes these long bus rides where she is actually noticing things and you kind of cheer for her because you're like wow finally she's she says this, and she says, for the first time, I started noticing things. Previously, she stopped. She doesn't notice so someone's just simple things, holding an apple or you know, holding a notepad, until they actually start to show. Oh, I didn't notice they were because she's so sort of taken by the spiritual side of her. She, you know, she doesn't really notice the world in front of her and what the world is actually like until she's forced to confront actually what her own um, place is in that world and how she can affect a change. And once she breaks free and on that long bus ride that's when she decides she's not going to actually go through with the marriage which her parents have laid out for her with Karamjeet actually yeah. and then, yeah. then that's when she starts noticing the world she noticed she notices you know this these you know the, the beauty in the world with even without this without relying on faith yeah yes. yeah um, and while on the subject of the world I think it's interesting that uh, Marlon your novel um, is clearly an attempt uh, to capture everything in a way. <laughs> um, mm. But it's also interesting that you don't have a narrator, you have all these different voices. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me almost as uh, the, the, the sort of the expanse, the canvas of the novel is expanding, mm -hmm. but the sort of authoritativeness of the novelist. Mm -hmm is reducing yeah. concomitant and both these things seem to be going hand in hand whereas with the earlier more classical like i said novelist you would have the voice of the narrator of the mm. novelist actually talking to the writer in the 19th century novel but with mm. with this newer form of the novel which i think you're attempting mm. the range increases incredibly but the knowingness mm. uh, actually decreases and there's yeah. So yeah. Well, I didn't want. I didn't want that voice. Mm. I. I didn't want the narrative authority. I didn't want the. The. the I think the the, the. the narrator who knows everything that uh, that authoritative voice can be essential to fiction. It still is, and I'm probably going back to it with my next book. Mm -hmm. But this was a story where I just I really wanted to sort of transform myself into a journalist. 
um, you know, reporting on interior lives of, of, of mm -hmm. characters, and the one voice that I did not want in it was mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't, I just thought, certainly for this novel, this was the kind of book where I could throw it to the characters to tell the story, and that, uh, it's funny because one of the, the translators of the novel had a very big problem with it because of that. She just thought it was really sloppy editing that nothing was adding up. I'm like, it's not supposed to add up. It's, uh, you have people, a lot of these characters are talking about the very same thing, sometimes exactly. the very same scene, and have a very different perception. Because, you know, even an autobiography is just one person's opinion. You know, so, and, and I wanted that in there, so there's no, there's no, there, there would be no finality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to respond? I, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's the same for you, but I find this part of deciding the voice in which the novel will be told mm -hmm. to be almost the hardest part of, uh, yeah. you know, the whole structuring business. And in this book, uh, sections of it are in third person, like the one I read out. And there are whole chunks in first person told in the voice of a child remembering her past mm -hmm. and I found those parts incredibly hard to do because you have to think of a new language what 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 would this child notice how would she speak so I had to reduce the language to a kind of its mm -hmm. elements and there is a scene where uh, the opening scene of the book where some uh, people come and kill her father in front of her eyes and they write on the wall in his blood and so when I was thinking there's this child looking at this wall and her father's just been obviously she cannot read what was written so the novel will only say that they wrote something in his blood and then they uh, left so she is left with this lifelong sense of incompleteness mm -hmm. of not knowing what really happened and many people have complained to me, readers, about the uncertainty in this book. Mm -hmm. They say it's full of edges and uncertainties and uh, in Sri Lanka where I was doing readings just before this, they would keep asking me specific questions <laughs> from the audience saying, did A die? Did B finally jump into the water? And I really wanted this to have a kind of elusiveness and mm -hmm. uncertainty of the kind you're saying you yeah. get from not asserting your authority mm -hmm. as the writer. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time though. I, I do have a few more questions, but I would like to open up, up to the audience. Um, if you, yeah. Uh, is there just one mic? It's cold. Huh? Sure, do take cold. Yeah, my question is Sanjeev. Okay. Yeah, I read your novel. It's one of the fantastic novel I read, uh, and I love the characters. My question is, which character do you feel is much close to you? The character which you hard uh, worked really hard for informing. Character that was the hardest. Um, it's really childish to have favourites, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but I, You're allowed to. But okay. I, I do have. <laughs> um, I think I've thought he took the longest for me to actually um, write. The other three seem to, Dochi in particular, write very fully formed, who's, and, um, and, in the, and um, Narendra as well. Um, and, but, uh, and I think he's, in the first couple of drafts of the book, he was very much sort of a sidekick, sort of, not a sidekick, but a sort of a, a secondary character, sort of Randeep's friend. But then, um, through one of the drafts, I realised that he was going to have a much larger role, and he grew from that. Um, he doesn't seem to be anyone else's favourite character and readers that sort of say to me but here's a my purely because I think he's the one who's actually stays tries to be good for the longest for the sake of being good itself he's not relying on faith or any other sense he's he tries to be you know behave as sort of as, as rightly as he can until it just becomes too hard for him to be good and he does then at the end acts in um, you know I think a slightly appalling way and um, that and his spirit was broken and also at the end of the book there's an epilogue and he's probably out before he's probably the one who's in the least good place at the end so i he probably touches me the most i'd say i think one more short question and short answer <laughs> uh, hello my question is to all three of you uh, first uh, 
what is more important uh, is it the strength of the plot or the craft of telling that story what is more important the and craft secondly uh, while you were conceiving the idea of this book or while even writing did he had even is a minute inkling that you would be listed in the book there's the book question <laughs> uh, that question had to happen why why is anurada you want to answer oh, um, i think that uh, i i think that when you are uh, constructing a narrative when you're structuring it of course you plot it but you want the plot to be quite invisible i uh, you you do not want it to appear a plotted novel although every novel is plotted even the novels in which apparently a set of tiny tiny non events seem to add up to some luminous meaning it is a plotted novel but the plot is not apparent and that's my ideal kind of novel uh short point g i actually i do plot almost ad nauseum yeah. actually draw plot charts on the wall yeah um or i have books with just diagrams and so on i do it out i spend days on it and then i totally ignore it yeah <laughs> I think I just get I, it just clears my head yeah. but I have to leave you know human beings surprise us all the time they disappoint us all the time so I have to still leave space where those two things can happen with a character but I usually do it just to just clear my head Yeah and I am um, I plotted this novel quite heavily at the outset and then as Marlon said the thing that you start off thinking is is the plot that's going is the bit of the plot that's going to hold all things together it's the first thing to go that's sort of yeah. inevitable and um but for me plot and character are just inextricable they've you know as Henry James said you know plot is character in action and there's something i hold quite fast to mm -hmm. i think you really need even if you're writing a novel of ideas you need a strong narrative thread which the over and above above and below there will be all these ideas with with a narrative thread to loop the reader to lead the reader along to discover all the all the bigger things in the book mm -hmm. so you don't end up writing an essay mm -hmm. thank you so much sanjeev so. marlan anurada this was the book of book self so thank you and a big round of applause for sanjeev marlan anurada and anjum lovely session very nice thank you so very much for being here